Hello, welcome to the MIT Social Entrepreneurship Alumni Group webinar, How Digitization is Reshaping Investing in Africa. I am Sayuri Sharper, president of SEEK and moderator of today's conversation. Today, we are privileged to have Jim Chu, CEO of Untap, to lead a conversation about digital investment revolution taking place in emerging markets. In this webinar, Jim will discuss a complementary revolution that digital technology is enabling, new social enterprises to serve local financial needs, and also digital platforms to make investing in developing markets easier, cheaper, and more accessible to individual investors. This webinar is a conversation and we would like to make this webinar as interactive as we can. You're invited to use a Q&A button to enter your questions at any time during the webinar. We'll get to as many of your questions as we can before the end of the hour. Now, before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about MIT SEEG. SEEG is organized under MIT Alumni Association. Our mission is to bring together MIT alumni and like-minded people to co-create a better world through social entrepreneurship and impact investing. Terminology is important. What do we mean by social entrepreneurship? Any organization that is addressing unmet social need or environmental problem through a market-driven approach. And impact investments are investments made with the intent to contribute measurable positive social or environmental impact. If any of you are not a SIG member yet, I'd like to invite you to join us. In addition to webinars, we also host live pitch sessions, mentoring programs, and other networking events to connect our members to each other. To join, please go to mit-c.mn.co. Now let me introduce Jim. Jim is a Thanks, friend, Larry. a colleague, and a fellow board member at MC Social Capital. He is also a diehard optimist. He <laughs> believes that entrepreneurship and innovation can improve the lives of billions while offering strong returns for investors. He's the founder and CEO of Untap Global and founder, producer, and host of The Nest, a global investment community that connects aspiring entrepreneurs in frontier markets with angel investors from around the world. Prior to his work in emerging markets, Jim spent 25 plus years in the tech industry in Silicon Valley. He has a BA and MA in international studies from Stanford. Jim. Thank you for having me on. It's a real honor and pleasure to be talking about this topic. And I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, I, I may seem like an optimist, but I actually consider myself a realist in the sense that I think business and market incentives are really the only way to keep everybody accountable. And so ultimately, I think uh, I believe in entrepreneurship and business because I believe people are selfish and I believe people want to create value so they can capture value. And so, um, yes, I am an optimist because I do believe entrepreneurship can do a tremendous amount in the world, but I also believe that because I've seen the other side as well. But thank you very much for the uh, pleasure of speaking here and uh, thank you for introducing the topic. Um, digitization, and you know, I think this is, a, this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. And like Sayuri said, I'd like to try to keep this as interactive and as open a discussion as possible. So I really welcome your questions and your comments in the chat. Um, and because this is all very new for all of us, there are no experts, we're all experts. And I really would like to hear from the audience on their experiences so we can really create a dialogue on what the future is going to look like. 
But just to repeat a little bit of what Sayuri was saying on digitization. Um, I know we can't raise hands here, but I'm going to just do that very quickly uh, and ask this question. You know, how many of, of us have uh, own NFTs? Okay, virtually we'll, we'll raise hands here. And if you can do it, uh, you can do that online. I'm assuming that there's a small number. How many of you three months ago had even heard of an NFT? How many of you six months ago had even heard about NFT or even DeFi, decentralized finance? I can't see all the hands going up, but I can guarantee you that things have happened so fast in the last six months. I didn't know what DeFi was nine months ago, six months ago. But there's a revolution happening on the digital investment side that happened way before NFTs and DeFi came along. You know, if we look at the history of investing, it started off as old people uh, shaking hands and uh, in a room, and it was all very much a country club private affair to invest, especially in things like venture capital and what one would call alternative assets. Uh, even the stock market was only for those who could afford a, a stock broker. Charles Schwab changed that with discount investing. Uh, other platforms came along. Um, TD Ameritrade came along with discount investing. So many people did that in the public markets and it changed things. It gave more access to more types of investments for people. What we're seeing today in the last few years is a further broadening of that access to not just the public markets, but also to alternative investment instruments. So today, through investment platforms like Republic, republic.com, or WeFunder, or other types of crowdfunded or crowd-pooled investment platforms, you as an individual, oftentimes accredited investor, can now invest in things that were only accessible to those who were rich, mostly white, mostly male. And so, we, I see this revolution continuing to happen. We obviously know about Robinhood and most people know about what happened with GameStop. You know, the public investment ecosystem created all these different impacts and waves in the investment environment. So digital investing, what I would call digital investing is changing how people invest and who's investing. And DeFi, decentralized finance in particular, is also changing that. And you know, I'm not a soothsayer, so I don't know what's going to happen in five years, but I'm willing to bet my money that over the next five years, we're going to see incre increasingly more innovations around how you can invest, whether that's through crypto, whether that's Bitcoin or stablecoin like a UDC, or simply using crypto in the back end or DeFi in the back end to allow various different types of investors to invest. That's happening and we're not gonna change that. And I personally think that's a very exciting thing because more and more people will be able to access investment instruments that were not previously available to, to many. However, I think there is a complementary revolution happening that many of you on this call also know about. And that's the revolution that's happening on the uh, dig on the digitization of emerging markets. So most of us know that in uh, continents like Africa or the markets in Africa, such as Nigeria or uh, Kenya or uh, South Africa or Egypt, 60, 70% of the economy is informal. And what does that mean? It means that people are using cash and buying things, um, you know, one merchant to another. So it's very much a decentralized uh, economy already in Africa. What's been happening slowly over the last 10 years, and it's truly accelerating in the last few years, is that entire landscape is becoming digitized. We all know about M-Pesa in Kenya, where M-Pesa is a digital currency, and people are using M-Pesa to pay for things. Okay, well, so what? Well, that means that we can actually see those transactions. Beyond that, we can actually start to use the data from those transactions to do better things like better credit scoring or understanding where people are spending money so that we can invest more in those areas. So that's changing how we're 
uh, able to see what's happening in those informal markets. It's going way beyond that even. There is an explosion of companies in Africa that uh, we're very much as Untapped Global actively investing in that have smart devices, smart assets, data at the core of their uh, business model. So again, we've probably heard about companies who are using data to do better credit scores. I think that's really good. But there are also companies that are changing how they engage their customers altogether. So instead of selling their customers a product, instead of selling somebody a motorcycle, they're saying, use this motorcycle and we'll let you pay as you go for that motorcycle. We'll let you pay as you go for uh, the water that you buy or the water treatment system that you're using to create clean water. We'll let you pay as you go to use that solar system powering your home. All those new uh, business ventures, new innovations in emerging markets, it's creating a sea of data that can now be used to better understand the market, to better manage risk in the market, and to better serve the customers that are in those markets. So if we look at the two sides, on one side, we have a increasingly digital and individual investing landscape and investing platforms that allow people like you and me and others to invest in what were considered alternative off-limit assets. And on the other side, we have economies that are massive. We're talking about $1 trillion a year in just in Africa alone in the informal market. That's digitizing. So now we can see what's happening, but also measure it also use it to manage risk, and also use it to control a bit more of how we deploy capital. So if you bring the two sides together, I think that's where there's a really, a truly, well, both of those revolutions are historic, but the coming together of those two sides is also a historic opportunity. Because we can now, if we bring those two sides together, we can now create a revolution in how money flows from places like the United States, or Europe, or places where there is an abundance of capital, and how that can flow to places like Africa or Southeast Asia or Latin America, where there is a dearth of capital. And we can do that in a way that is more efficient and more peer-to-peer -peer and more transparent than the old system of going through intermediaries. And I personally believe that it's going to be much more efficient. So, I think, and, and just a quick introduction, I'm, I'm very biased in this whole discussion because we're building a company around this, this concept. And we think that we can, by marrying these two sides, bring more cash into the African investment landscape, but also create opportunities for individual entrepreneurs to access capital and grow their businesses in a way that is not possible for them in through traditional finance. So I'm gonna stop there for a second because we've covered a lot of different topics. And I'd love to hear from Sayeri and also the audience um, on comments and questions so we can start diving deeper into this topic or these topics, I should say. Yeah, Jim, that, that was a lot of information to digest. So um, I'll start off and kind of uh, with some questions and uh, let the, everybody else that is on the call catch up and uh, think about some questions that they may have. So, so you talked about this digital revolution uh, and let's uh, start on the, rather than the platform side on the entrepreneur side. Um, what uh, can you provide some maybe example uh, of how you are seeing? Uh, yeah, maybe two, so, three examples so folks can yeah. kind of get and an I'll, understanding. Actually, I'll uh, you know give that uh, give the examples through kind of a bit of a historical uh, context. Uh, how we actually uh, we or I or the company arrived on this business model. We actually started off with with water and water infrastructure. And so I was running a company in Haiti called Zelo Haiti, delivering clean water to underserved uh, communities. And one of the main uh, pain points that we had was where do we get the capital to grow? And it was very, very challenging. And one of the innovations that we came up with, you know, 
lending money to a, a poor Haitian is very tricky because, well, you know, you can either take the money and uh, do it, run your business, or you can take the money and feed your children. That's a hard choice sometimes. And I don't begrudge anyone to, uh, any Haitian entrepreneur to necessarily, sometimes moving that money over, right? But that's the problem with money. What we actually ended up doing in Haiti was uh, providing entrepreneurs with machines that were IoT, Internet of Things enabled and had PAVGO systems on them so that we can now track exactly how much water is being produced and sold and also run it as a PAVGO system. They pay for what they use. And so if you... If you can imagine, that's really a form of financing. We didn't give them money. We gave them a machine that they, allows them to produce money. So initially we started doing that in other parts of the world. And then it brought into, wow, there's all sorts of different kinds of assets that can benefit from this approach. And in fact, it was already happening in the marketplace. So let me give you some of the top examples that we found. One, it's already happening in the mobility marketplace. Um, leasing of motorcycles so that for motorcycle taxis, that's been around forever. And that's been around um, informally uh, in some oftentimes in a very exploitive and inefficient manner. Well, people have taken that business model and digitized it and now can lend to motorcycle taxi drivers in a more efficient way through a digitized platform down to tracking where the motorcycle is and who's paying and all the things that you know need to know in order to manage risk and financing. And so we provide financing to companies like that because essentially you're giving a loan to the motorcycle taxi driver. It's a, it's a loan in terms of a piece of asset, but you're using data to better manage the risk in providing financing to that driver. And, and this is where it really is interesting in, in marrying the two sides, you're actually creating a digital revenue stream that can be tracked, traced in real time. And at some point in time, and I'm not saying that we're doing this today, but at some point in time, connect those digital revenue streams that are coming from African markets to investors who are willing to buy those digital revenue streams. So I see this bridge happening sometime in the next few years, five years. I hope, I'm hoping that we're the ones who pioneer it and, and make it happen. There are a lot of regulatory hurdles to make that happen, but uh, we believe that's where things will start to change, where it'll become truly an optimized uh, marketplace for capital flows. I don't know if I answered your question or not, Sayuri. Yes, uh, yeah, you have, but I think we can dig into some more details a little bit more. But before we go there, I've got a couple of questions of folks that are interested um, in uh, the platform side, the uh, investor side. So let me ask uh, those questions uh, for, uh, for them. Uh, one uh, is coming from Shiva. I am horrible at reading uh, complicated last names, so uh, uh, I apologize. And I'm just going to do it with uh, first names. Um, he says, thanks, Jim. Great concept. Would this platform be restricted to Africa, excuse me, Africa, or can this be utilized in other markets? Yeah, so our, our goal is to take this platform global. Uh, thank you, Shiva, for the question. Uh, meaning to uh, all markets where there is a financing gap for small businesses, small entrepreneurs. Um, our, our first target is Africa because that's where we've been investing and where we discovered this real problem. Um, and that's where our expertise is. So, but we are already in some other markets. We're already in Mexico and we, we intend to move into Indonesia. Uh, soon with with uh, this model and sometime in 2023. Um, you know, whether we go into South Asia, uh, India and Pakistan, I think that's a that's that's yet to be seen. Uh, we don't have very much expertise there, but I I encourage potential entrepreneurs or potential partners or even microfinance institutions or other financing institutions, if they would like to partner on this, we'd be very happy to discuss because we do need that local expertise to understand 
how we deploy the capital in those markets, who are the right operating partners. And currently we only have that in uh, a number of markets in Africa, you know, Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, Egypt, and, and Nigeria. Um, and we're trying to develop that for some other markets such as Mexico and Indonesia. Okay, and this other question is from Daniel. Uh, how are policies and regulations influencing digital payments across the continent? Yeah, I, you know, look, there, there's, there's a myriad, uh, there's a whole range of policies uh, and restrictions and issues. And, you know, we're, we're a little bit going back to Shiva's question. We're not trying to go everywhere yet. We're trying to go into the markets where um, uh, the regulation and the policies and the general market environment is the most um, open to digital payments and um, digitization in general. So, uh, and, and those, those are pretty clear what they are. I mean, Nigeria is one of the big FinTech innovators in Africa, obviously Kenya with M-Pesa leading the way already decades ago, but uh, continuing to innovate but also places like South Africa, where there is a very strong banking sector already. But there are, the great thing about the South African government, it has been very open-minded in innovations around FinTech and uh, allowing uh, new innovations around digital payments to come in. So uh, it does influence a lot in terms of us deciding where we can, where we can work um, and where the opportunity is. And I, I really truly encourage governments to think about their digital strategy. I'm not a government policymaker, so I really don't know how difficult or easy that is, but I really encourage them to think about um, policies. And you know, you, we already hear stories about El Salvador uh, accepting Bitcoin. So I think that's happening. And I personally think that will happen in markets where mainstream financial infrastructure works less well because it's a bigger pain point, right? So it's solving a bigger pain point. So I, uh, I don't know if I answered your question, Daniel, but I, uh, from, from our company's perspective, it has a huge influence. And I think more broadly, I think government regulations and policies have a huge impact, um, not just on the acceptance of digital payments, but also on the future of those economies. Because I believe so much of our future economy is going to depend on uh, decentralized finance, and a term that I didn't use earlier, decentralized ownership. Okay, um, before I go back to some of the other questions that's coming in from the audience, uh, and by the way, the audience questions uh, that are coming in through chat, uh, can you put them in Q&A so it's a little bit easier for me to manage. Uh, so uh, I would appreciate it if you not use chat, uh, but use uh, Q&A uh, format. Uh, uh, but before we go on, because I think that maybe some of the audience may not understand the differentiation you made uh, between the operators um, of these business versus the the um, loan that you are making yeah, yeah, to no, the end user the through the operator. So maybe you can kind of clarify. Yeah, I, kind of and I don't want to spend the entire time talking about untap our business. So yeah, yeah, just, just kind detail, of... But... Yeah, just I, I kind of in terms of what, uh, what you mean by that. Outcome. Yeah, yeah. No, so I, I think the point I would make there to, to answer your question and the, the point I would make is that um, we work through what we call operating partners. And these are tech-enabled companies who are providing some kind of asset to small businesses to make money. And so uh, we work through those operating partners. And I think that's it's a really critical differentiation because there are so many different people innovating and creating incredible innovations around business model innovations on how to serve these markets. And I'll give you a few examples. Um, Flex Club, which provides car subscriptions to Uber drivers, you know, it's all data and technology based, but they're just essentially providing cars. Um, or Another company in South Africa, called iDrop, they provide water treatment systems, but it's all technology enabled. Or another company we work with, Paga, they do payments and they have a whole payments back end, but they also provide 
point of sale systems or devices to small merchants so they can start collecting um, digital payments. So all of those companies have some physical asset at the core of their business and providing that asset to uh, small businesses so that they can run their businesses more efficiently. So we work through them and we essentially make it easier for them to access on-demand capital so they can execute their business model. And we take their data, <coughs> excuse me, we integrate with their data systems, take their data and use that data as an ongoing risk management tool for our financing, our decision-making around financing. So instead of like a, you know, the conventional approach to financing where we look at <coughs> three month old financial statements and uh, force you to put a mortgage on your house to uh, borrow money. We use the data and the future, the data to, <coughs> excuse me, manage risk, but also take the future revenue streams coming from assets as the collateral versus your house. Okay, um, I, I guess going a little bit deeper into that question, you know, a lot of these companies, some of them are fintech startups. Um, they are probably initially very much financed by equity uh, since uh, they need uh, equity piece to develop their business. And then they, uh, a lot of them also then, if they're, they have a financial products and uh, um, it's equity that is providing uh, their ability to lend. And I, th I think the model you're talking about is really more on the debt size to provide them with uh, capital to lend based on the business that they have. Can you talk a little bit about the kind of the, the difference between yeah. equity and debt and, and how you play in that? And a little more about how you reduce a risk element from your lending. Yeah, look, I, and um, that, that question, that comment is, is really critical. And I, even Shiva's um, most recent um, uh, question or comment is also very relevant to this, this, this topic. Um, so yes, a, a lot of startups um, raise equity, um, partly because in many cases, that's the only thing that's available to them. There's a huge gulf between equity and commercial debt, huge. Talk about crossing the chasm, that's crossing the Grand Canyon. Um, there's a huge gap there. And so oftentimes companies, even fairly mature companies, established companies have to use equity in order to finance the capital intensive business model that they have. In some cases that might make sense, but in most cases it doesn't. Because as much as uh, some entrepreneurs think that equity, raising equity money is free money, it's very expensive money. And so what, what we try to do or the alternative that we're trying to offer is something that's non-dilutive. Now, debt is usual the, usually the way people go. We actually don't provide debt. We actually do a revenue share agreement with our operating partners. So it is, if you will, has some profiles of equity, although we don't own a portion of the company, but we are dependent on the performance of the company in order to be repaid. Or rather, we're dependent on the performance of the assets that we finance in order to be repaid. So we actually are in the same boat as the entrepreneurs or the operating partners in sharing the risk with them um, for, for doing that financing. So I'll give you an example. One of the partners that we finance, uh, a company called ASAC, um, we provided financing to them and it did it integrated with them and could see in real time what was happening with their business. And when their business started to go down because of some lockdowns in 2021, we saw that, but we also saw that going back up in, in early August. And so we were able to make immediate decisions around financing using the data that they provided. A debt provider simply can't do that. And so using the data model to help them grow allowed them to reach this next milestone where they ended up raising and they just closed a $30 million round, right? Because they are able to scale using our non-dilutive financing in order to get to that level. And, and we will always 
be able to play a role in all these types of companies as that on-demand high growth capital, which is what really all of these companies need. Hey, thanks uh, for uh, clarifying. Um, here's another question from Shiva. Uh, he says, any thought on partnering with micro VCs uh, in various regions to provide uh, and extend your network? Yeah, all right. So, so this does relate to the previous one, which is, and, and to your question. So the equity investments and what we do go hand in hand, right? So quite, quite frankly, unless there's a company that's already well advanced and have really good, has really good cash flow, we're not going to work with a company that hasn't been venture funded, generally speaking, an operating partner that is, right? Because like you said, Sayuri, Sayuri you need the equity capital to spend the money to develop the technology, to get things going, to get set things all up, to prove the model out. You need that first. So I can imagine going to Shiva's question, many, uh, many companies coming out of those VC, whether they're incubator programs or just general investments by those VCs and micro VCs, that then we provide the growth capital for them to scale. Now, you might ask, well, why doesn't a VC just do that? Oftentimes, a VC doesn't have a mandate to do, do that. Seldom have I seen, there are some, seldom have I seen venture capital firms who raise a fund who do equity and growth debt. So uh, we, provide, we can work hand in hand with those equity investors to help their companies grow, and we all benefit. And by the way, sometimes uh, we also take equity investments in, in some of the companies using the data and our experience working with them as, if you will, the due diligence for be becoming equity investors. So we've talked a lot uh, about the entrepreneur side or the business side of this digitization and how that enables better way of sharing risk and revenue. Um, how about on the platform side? How, how do you see uh, that um, as an investor to participate uh, in some of these investing, you're talking about the innovation there. How, how do you see that? Yeah, so I, you know, again, I think there's just so much happening on the DeFi, decentralized finance side. Things are gonna change. I, whatever I say now will be very different in 12 months. I can tell you also what our company is building, but I think as a more broad, um, a broader um, overview on things, I, I think what we see is an emergence of many investment platforms that, as I mentioned earlier, are targeting individual investors, especially in the DeFi world. Um, there are companies, several companies that are specifically raising money from crypto investors because there's just massive amount of liquidity in the crypto space right now. And so they raise money on, on those, they've created platforms that raise money in, in, in those marketplaces, and then they deploy um, their money in perhaps a more traditional way. We're hoping that we can work with some of these digital investment platforms to make, to even extend that digitization down to the deployment of cash. Let me clarify, I'm being maybe a little bit uh, confusing here. They'll use, DeFi, smart contracts, blockchain, et cetera, et cetera, to raise the money. But then when they give out the money, it's just traditional lending. I think um, that first part is already a revolution, right? You're using these new tools to raise money from a new source of capital, which is DeFi investors. But I think there's also this opportunity to extend that digitization down to how you deploy the capital as well. And that's what I mean by connecting the two sides. With all these different platforms, such as Goldfinch, which is one of the ones that uh, we're, we're, we're trying to work with, they're raising money from DeFi investors. They're specifically raising uh, USDC, you know, a stable coin, US dollar coin. And we're deploying that capital to digital assets. I hope one day that we can actually marry the two sides and say, okay, you're putting your money in, but then the smart contracts extend all the way down to the assets that we're financing. 
Now, this is probably years away because of regulatory hurdles and whatnot, but one day we should be able to allow a investor on the Goldfinch platform to be able to literally just buy into a contract with a portfolio of our operating partners. And it happens through smart contracts and it happens digitally and that's it. So, so Jim, that's probably what you said is what makes me think that you're an optimist. You have a, a big vision of uh, how things can be, but uh, you just uh, don't uh, just uh, rest with that vision, but actually go about trying to create the, uh, make that vision into a reality. So I guess from your point of view, you're being a realist and from <laughs> where I said, <laughs> you are an optimist. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, just to, to that note, yeah, you know, we also realize that we, we can't do that right now, right? If I, if I try to create a business model, pitch it and execute on it, I think we would fail today. But it doesn't mean that vision isn't valid. And so I think the, the uh, not the secret here, but I think the, the interesting journey that we're all going through is how do we stepwise move towards that vision? And I think that's the topic of this, of this discussion in this panel um, is there really are these multiple things happening. And if we try to create one big consolidated thing right now, that's too big of an elephant to chew. But we can say, look, we're going to, we're going to make that happen, but then start small steps along the way to line ourselves up so that in, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a futurist, but in one year's time or two years time, when the regulatory environment is clear enough to be able to do this, we simply make it happen because we've been doing it already. So here's a question from uh, the audience. Um, the question is, how does your platform address local regulations in international investments and repatriations? Uh, right, so this, this person is probably South African and talking about the South African Reserve Bank. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, there, there are, there's sort, all sorts of different um, regulations. I mean, look, I, I, and, and it depends on the market, right? In, um, in, in some markets, you know, the way that we structure our financings, um, they're, they're partnerships, right? They're not even financings. It's, uh, I think somebody from Egypt said, Untapped is just doing Sharia finance, right? Essentially, yes, you know, we're not giving a loan and charging interest. We're saying, look, we're gonna be a partner with you on these thousand motorcycles. And we'll take the revenue and sh share the revenue with you on those thousand thousand motorcycles. So that does change the, um, the the regulatory landscape for us a bit because, again, we're no longer uh, a lender and don't necessarily fall under a lender license. But oftentimes we're simply co-investors or equity investors, if you will, in those specific specific assets. Now I don't want to confuse anyone. You know, there's yeah. there's um, uh, I use the term equity in a very loose sense, yes. in the sense that we own, we have a contractual right to the revenue streams of, of the assets that we finance, but we don't own any equity in the company. So in, in some ways it's a revenue share. It is a revenue just share. Just actual revenue rather than a revenue share uh, that can be, I, I guess, part of the, as a payback for equity investment or whatever not, which right. is the other uh, model that is out there. Um, before I go to the next question, let me ask um, this other question because some of the impact investors that might be out there um, are probably more passionate about uh, really improving lives of people that are maybe more in the bottom of the pyramid. And um, this kind of revenue share, the operators are pretty well financed and they're on the way to uh, success. 
um, with your model, how, how do you think, uh, does it uh, help out people that are in the bottom of the pyramid? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, that's, that's really the ultimate objective. I mean, the ultimate objective is not necessarily per se the bottom of the pyramid, but entrepreneurs who need capital uh, to run a small business. I, I don't mean the operating partner, right? I don't mean the flex club or the pagas, but rather who do they enable? Who do they empower? And so in the case of a SOC, it is the millions of unemployed youth um, that because of population growth are there and without a job. So they're essentially giving them an opportunity for employment by becoming motorcycle taxi drivers. And of course, also creating more transport options and lowering the cost of transport by making uh, supply more available. Or uh, PAGA, their, I mean, our financing very specifically helps them provide these POS systems, devices, to small merchants, the ones who can't afford it in upfront. So uh, can't afford the total cost, but they can afford a lower cost. And so the way I see what we're doing is we're directly helping through these operating partners who are helping small businesses, small entrepreneurs access revenue generating assets so they can grow their business. Um, I'll give you just a few more examples. Um, we, we have a asset in Kenya, um, solar mobile uh, irrigation that helps smallholder farmers um, uh, have mechanized irrigation that's solar powered to uh, increase their yield on their farming. But I think the, the kind of the, the realization there is, yeah, okay, solar irrigation, a lot of people do solar irrigation, but by making it pay as you go and making it a uh, smart asset, it allows a group of farmers to use the same asset and share it. So now, if even if you're, the size of your plot is too small to justify mechanized irrigation for you to own it yourself. You can still get the services of mechanized irrigation and increase your yield, even if you're a small farmer. So I think the concept here is there are many, many benefits to many different stakeholders when you take expensive assets and divvy up their utilization so that more people can benefit from, economically benefit from that asset. And that's what I think smart assets allow the marketplace to do. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it seems like, Jim, if there is someone that will provide that working capital um, and it's, it's not just VC equity, uh, even with this revenue share model, uh, you can enable um, a lot of folks that want to serve these uh, uh, bottom of a pyramid or uh, or asset uh, providing type companies to to enable them to do it since the gross capital comes from you. How how, how much um, um, track record uh, do you look for? in your operators for yeah. you to so, have interest. So I heard uh, a really interesting comment uh, there in the beginning, and then I'll answer your second question. You know, I, I think working with the, the the VCs and, you know, kind of providing a window, the, the, the role that I see us playing, so we're, we're clearly not the operating partner, right? We're not operating the assets ourselves. Uh, in many cases, we're also not looking to raise the money ourselves. Right. Uh, obviously, we're working with investment platforms and whatnot, but we want to be uh, this important consolidating link between the two sides because we often feel that you're either on one side or the other. Right. You're 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 either deploying capital and you're always struggling to get it, or you have an investment platform but you're so distant from the actual activity on the ground, um, your risk isn't man managed very well. We want to be right there in the middle, that helps the two sides. So we wanna be able to consolidate the various different sources of financing on one side. And we wanna consolidate the various different operating partners who need that capital on the other side and bring it together in the middle and use that data to de-risk both sides of the, of the equation and make it easier for both sides. So I think, um, uh, you know, I'm not bashing conventional finance. We're just trying to make, we're just trying to fit the 
small entrepreneurship problem into the size uh, requirements and other requirements of more traditional lenders and yeah. otherwise as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, this is another question from Shiva. And my, my challenge to the rest of you is uh, join the conversation if, uh, uh, and, and this is a very interesting, but uh, probably fairly complex topic. So if you want to ask Jim more clarification or the, the, just to help you understand, just you know, write those questions and we'll, we'll get them addressed. Um, so Alden so, here asked a very, very, very yeah. good question. Uh, can we answer that one first? Yeah, if yeah, yeah. Know, and now we'll come back to Shiva. So yeah, she, Alden Alden asked, first, yeah. Yeah, is revenue share capped or a lifetime of the asset? It's a very, and who, who pays for the maintenance? Two very important questions that I think illustrate very well the three part responsibility that is involved in one of these revenue share deals. So we are uh, very careful that we don't create what I call serfdom or servitude, long-term servitude, right? So most of the, the financings we do or the partners that we work with they're on some type of lease to own model. Certainly with the um, motorcycle leasing, for example, you lease it for a certain amount of time and you own it. So we're creating ownership in the marketplace. And that's, I think, very important. That's not the case in every single asset because not every single asset can be or should be owned by. So for example, we work with a company called iDrop in South Africa that does wire treatment systems in grocery stores. The grocery stores don't really want to own those machines. So there is an ownership chance for there. But we are very uh, conscious and aware that we want to create asset ownership in the marketplace. And so to the extent that it makes sense for the business model, we really look at um, uh, transferring ownership to, to the owners. Now, second part of your question, Alden, uh, who pays for the maintenance? That's a really critical part of this three-way relationship because as you already connoted, there's always some type of maintenance management overhead that needs to be taken care of. And if you don't take care of it, <clears throat> um, those models usually don't work very well. And so usually we rely on the operating partner to ensure that that asset is operating well and they're incentivized to do so as well because they have a revenue share. So the more the asset gets used, the more they're likely to, to earn money, excuse me. <coughs> I'm just talking too much, I don't have COVID. <laughs> so I won't infect anyone on this call. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, so that asset ownership uh, is, is important. And I think you had a second part of your question that I didn't answer that I think was really important as well. So Yuri. Oh, my, my, my second part is um, how much track record do you need from the operators? Right. So that's, that's important because uh, it, it will depend on the kind of assets and where and so on, but we need a fairly extensive track record. But it isn't the same kind of track record as most lenders. We need to see the asset deployed with enough frequency and with enough of a track record to understand that asset business model. So obviously we wanna understand an operating yeah. partner's business and their financials and how they are as a team and all the things that equity investor looks at. But what we're most interested in is how many assets have you deployed? What do the unit economics look like for real of the assets you deploy? And have you, have you done it at some level of scale to show that you can do it at broader scale? Yeah. Um, so, you know, but I'll depend, right? So. Yeah. Um, with a motorcycle taxi provider, yeah, you probably need to have done at least a hundred, if not more, to show that you can do that, that mm -hmm. you can manage that. And by the way, and we do our, we call it pilot due diligence, but we essentially, or a due diligence pilot, I should say, um, we actually give the money out, small amounts first, to assess how they data integrate, how they deploy the capital, how they do all that before we give them any more money. Yeah. And so, um, but at the very, very beginning and the very minimum, we do need to see that you know how to manage the asset, that you have the data system to do the asset, and that, that that asset generates enough margin 
to be shared enough to cover maintenance to um, I think uh, the previous question and enough to uh, give the operator a living wage, a good living wage and enough to repay our investors. So I think this relates to kind of how um, this whole thing works. So this is um, from, I guess his, uh, his name is shown as ADD. Uh, how does your platform address data capture and processing? Is it done by your local partners? And also, are you working with Angaza, which I have no idea who that yeah, is. Yeah, so they're, they're, a, they're a, solar, <laughs> uh, a solar finance uh, company. A solar uh, system, consumer solar unit uh, system finance company. Um, yeah, so, so uh, okay, sorry, did it disappear already? <laughs> it disappear? Oh, yeah. Um, no, it's but, okay. So, uh, um, yeah, I think how, it's related to the ne uh, the question about really how, how do, do data you collect yeah. data, data? So this is really, it's important. So what we try to do is we simplify the data structure. We created a tech stack that allows us to uh, take in, in a harmonized way, data from a variety of different business partners, and then um, create a, if you will, common view or common user experience for investors. So that's not, uh, so, th so that means that there's a, it's a double-edged sword there, right? That means that we can cover many different sectors, but it also means that we don't go quite as deep as a sector-specific tool or data platform. So we created a set of APIs that covers just a subset of our operating partners' data. The set, that, and that subset is important to create a consistent view across our asset types. Um, but in Angaza, for example, their specialization is, you know, home solar systems. Great. Well, you know, we don't collect as much data on home solar systems, but we're relying on a partner like Angaza to do that. And all we're really doing is covering a subset of that so that we can create a consistent set of data for investors. So um, uh, another question, this is from James. Uh, what is the effective interest rate for moto by operators in Kenya? Yeah, so it, it ranges dramatically and, and our, our different operating partners have different business models. So I can't speak to the exact uh, interest rates that they charge, but oftentimes they charge um, based on the revenues that are produced. So uh, some of our Kenyan partners, uh, such as FICA, for example, it's an electric motorcycle provider. Um, they essentially run the fleet and they will pay the uh, operators, um, the, the drivers themselves, for the actual deliveries that they do. So I, you know, I, I, I think it would be difficult to say that there's a very specific interest rate uh, charged by any of them. It just, it ranges from business model to business model. So, so when you do the re revenue share, does that uh, uh, affect how much the operator, do they increase uh, how much, um, how whatever the terms that they have with their, um, I guess, clients or whatnot uh, uh, when they um, accept uh, your uh, revenue share? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we, we obviously want to make the terms reasonable, meaning the, the amount of time uh, reasonable. Um, and also the, um, you know, whether it fits within the, the money that's being made. So we, we have to look at every single asset type individually to assess that. So we have uh, financings as short as, I think 11 months is the shortest that we have. But we also have ones that are three years and, and even longer. But to, to your point, um, you know, sometimes you have to stretch that time period out in order to make the numbers work because the operator needs to be able to take home money. They need to be able to make a living wage, not even a living wage, they need to make money. And that money that they make needs to be attractive enough to attract good writers good operators. So we're just shooting ourselves in the foot if we try to, you know, undercut and uh, exploit those operators, because at the end of the day, them making money is what makes sense for us. Um, here's a question from Lee. How do you overcome concerns around legal risk uh, inherent in emerging markets? 
you're operating in or entering. <clears throat> yeah, and look, we're we're selective about the markets that we that we enter. Um, you know, so so most of the markets we enter, we uh, have a have a pretty good um, legal structure. You know, Kenya has a, a good legal system that uh, allows us to enforce contracts. But you know, part of that too is really um, the relationship we build with the operating partners. Um, and I'm much more of the school that you line up incentives and you line up the partnership in the right way. And then of course you codify that with the legal structure. But if you try to impose a legal structure that is just trying to pull people back from doing things that they're already incentivized to do that you don't want them to do, that's never gonna really work. So we, we, we don't believe in this maybe a US based focus like if you just put it in the contract, no matter how unrealistic it is, it'll happen. Right. We want to create something that's realistic, that is incentivized or incentive aligned. And then we put a contract around that. And we work in countries where there's a decent legal system. Okay, this is uh another question from Shiva. Uh, what do regulators? Uh, sorry, yeah, I okay. want to come back to the Shiva, but I also want to okay. address Juan's question in a slightly different way as well. Okay. Some of this is always in terms of risk. It's also about diversification, right? So if you invest in a single company, you're exposed 100% to the risk of that currency, that government, that market. But because we've diversified across a number of different markets with fairly different profiles, actually. You know, Mexico is different than South Africa. South Africa is different than Egypt. Egypt is different than Nigeria. Each one of them has their own risks. But because it's diversified across all of them, if suddenly there's a coup in Kenya and are actually, no, this, this is a real example. If there is a lockdown in Uganda in July of 2021, um, that's not going to have too big of an impact on our overall portfolio because it's just one player in the overall portfolio. Okay, shall we get to yes. Shiva's question? Yes. Uh, what do regulators need to do to make your job easier? Yeah, oof, great question. I haven't really thought about this. Um, you know, I think what regulators can do is to clarify the rules around digital payments, digital money, and also the rules on um, DeFi in those countries. You know, I, I think what the Nigerian government has done with you know, the quote unquote banning of crypto or of Bitcoin and whatnot, uh, that just means that some of that activity goes underground. Um, I don't think that helps innovation, nor does it help the ongoing development of the economy. So I think a, I think policymakers are well served to uh, embrace and regulate decentralized finance uh, in a way that serves the long-term interests of the economies. And that's, I mean, I, I barely understand DeFi. So I, I can imagine that's really hard for not only policymakers to understand, but also to sell to legislators. Yeah. But I think that's the challenge. And I think the, the countries that do that well will succeed in the 2020s, and those who do not do that well will be left behind. Yeah. Hey, let that be the last word. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for spending the last hour with us, and uh, we'll uh, keep on talking, and uh, you, you've got so many great leading ideas, so that, that would be really uh, interesting. Uh, for me and I'm sure for the, the rest of the audience to, to see what happens. Yes, and, and you know, just note, even though the vision may be this big hairy monster, uh, we are taking it step by step. So yeah. I, um, I hope that uh, each one of those steps can be valuable in and of themselves. But we also hope that when all those steps come together, we, we turn that big hairy monster into a very beautiful new, um, new creature. So. Yes. Uh, yes. DeFi is the name of the game. Digital, uh, uh, digitizing informal economies are the name of the game. My last word I would just say is we have decentralized finance. And what we're trying to do is to digitize decentralized ownership and bring those two together. Yes. Great. Um, 
it's uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, bye to everybody. And again, thanks, Jim. And we'll Thank see you, you, the rest of the audience in uh, uh, another webinar. Okay. Thank bye you very bye. much. And thank you again for the opportunity.